I think you're on mute, Sarah. At least I can't hear anything. Hi everybody, and uh, you're very welcome to today's webinar um, on medical device regulation. Um, as I'm sure you all know, MDR EU became uh, regulation as opposed to guidelines in 2021. And uh, now anyone who, um, any company who develops a medical device must uh, adhere to the regulations. Um, so today we're aware of the fact that we have a, a mixed audience. Um, some of our audience have a, a digital health innovation. Um, some have a medical device and some are in the space where they are trying to figure out whether their digital health innovation is a medical device. So I'm going to invite our first speaker, Peter Donnelly, to um, unmute and um, switch on his camera. Welcome, Peter. And Peter is going to um, to talk to us, first of all, about uh, medical device regulation vis-a-vis -vis digital health. And then he's going to introduce a segment where he's going to talk about software as a medical device, um, which will pertain to some of our participants here today. Um, some might not find that it uh, is, is relevant to you. Um, and Peter, what Peter Peter is a, a, an expert in this area, so he's very kindly agreed to condense his expertise into a few minutes for us. So obviously, if um, either the digital health or the software as a medical device piece uh, is uh, important for your business, you may need more information. So um, I'm going to hand over to Peter now and feel free to put questions in the Q&A and uh, to um, to send questions to us afterwards if, or queries if you would like more information. Now, Peter, before you begin, I'm actually just going to launch a poll to find out where our audience is in terms of medical device regulation. So the first poll I'm going to launch is 
uh, to find out, is your innovation classified as a medical device? Uh, you may say yes, no, I'm not sure, or uh, you're here today because you need help to determine that. So I wonder if you can please just fill out the poll for us. And, when, and I'll give you a few seconds there, about 10 seconds, and then we launch the results. Great, I think we have everybody. So um, I'll share the results. So we have um, a, about 22% of our population today say that they do have a medical device. Um, about half say that they don't, some are not sure, and some need help to determine that. So thanks very much for that. And I just have one more question before I hand over to Peter. Um, so I'd like you also to tell me, have you begun your journey on MDR? Uh, so I'm just going to launch that poll. OK, great. So we know that um, so far, um, all of those who have answered the poll say that they haven't begun their journey on MDR. So that gives us a good uh, idea of um, how to gauge the conversation. So, Peter, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Sarah mentioned, um, you know, I've sort of been involved with uh, with medical devices for a very long time, um, particularly, um, you know, the digital health uh, versions. I mean, I've supported a lot of uh, different companies through a business association, but uh, I've also founded some. So um, this is something that I've sort of lived for real. Um, and here are some of my experiences in it. Um, so the first question I, I get asked um, following an event that I'm, I'm probably speaking at is, uh, is my product a medical device? And I know that from the poll that there's still a lot of that question to be, to be determined. Um, and what do I need to do if it is? Well, a lot of it depends on the claims that you're making. Um, and we refer to that as intended use. I mean, this is, this is terminology that you will hear over and over again. Um, and that is that is very important. Uh, it's very important to define it. It will be used by the regulators quite a lot. So we need to find a, a statement that defines that properly. Um, and we, then we need to, if it is a medical device, we need to comply with the appropriate regulations. Um, as Sarah mentioned, um, from 2021, we sort of finished the uh, transition period um, from the old medical device directives. Um, to the new European medical device regulations. And of course, just to add complexity into it, the UK left the European Union, so they have a separate set of regulations that you need to comply with if you look to sell into the UK. So I thought really the first thing um, that, that you know, is, is important to understand is the sort of, if you like, the landscape um, that, 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 that we face. Um, and you are probably all very well aware of standards like ISO 9001. And the truth of it is, like about ISO 9001, it's a marketing standard. You know, there's no legal requirement to have that. In the medical device industry, if you're going to put a product on the market, it is law that you comply with the regulations to do that. So you have the regulatory authorities or what we call them as a competent authority um, for every country. Some countries being big enough might have separated themselves with two competent authorities alike of Germany, um, and they publish their regulations. So what happened with the European MDR was it was no longer left to the countries within Europe to determine the regulations or to, to take it as guidance and put it in. It became a European regulation, so it cannot be changed or altered in any way in any of the member countries. So that's the, that's the position that Ireland will be in. Um, the UK left that, as I mentioned, and they maintained the old medical device directive because that's what they had already um, transposed into law. So they just stayed with that and, and canceled the, the transition period. And then, of course, if you're looking at the, um, the US, you've got the, the FDA and their 21 CFR um, set of standards uh, and regulations. Um, 
depending on the classification, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later, but um, the regulatory authorities, if you've got a class one, and because there's just so many, um, they will be overwhelmed, um, uh, you know, being the asking notified bodies to go in and all, all class one devices. So you can register a class one device directly with the regulatory authority. For all other classifications of devices, you need a notified body. And basically, the notified body is an agent of the competent authority. Um, and they come in, they're the ones that audit you, and they're the ones that provide you with the certification of the CE mark or the UK CA mark. And then as medical device manufacturers, you know, we have to develop then standards um, that the regulations indicate. Um, and what you quite often find with regulations is they are uh, woolly, you know, they are non-specific, but certainly in terms of reading them, we do understand when they say that you'll have a quality management system, that what they mean is you have to have ISO 13485. When they talk about risk, that you will have ISO 14971. Um, and so they're all, and, and for the digital health ones, the 62304. So the, the competent authorities and the regulators, while everybody um, recognizes this as being like a huge overhead that you don't have in other industries, the regulatory authorities don't care about that because their end game is end user safety. What they will always go back to is, we impose these regulations for the purpose of keeping patients and healthcare professionals safe. So you'll see this slide quite a lot, um, and certainly I'm, I'm happy that anybody wants to take this away, but this is the, the route to market. Okay, so we want to, first of all, determine um, if the product is a medical device or an in vitro medical device, which some, some may be. Um, and it's back to that point that I made earlier. So any determination regarding the applicability of the medical device, you know, it's gotta be based on the intended purpose that intended purpose is, is hugely important. And it's got to properly describe how you intend to use the, the device, um, why the device will be used and by who. So let me give you an example. I mean, one of these is a medical device and one isn't. Okay, now I, I probably, I, I'm sure I would get 100% right. And that the one on the left is the medical device. Um, it followed certain standards, it followed the regulations, and it uh, manufactured a stick that could be used as a tongue depressor, but at the end of the day, it was still just a stick. Okay, now one of these is a medical device and one isn't. Um, and this is all comes down to intended purpose. The one on the right is the medical device, because the one on the left is a cuddly toy. The one on the right is filled with genetically modified grains that you could heat up or cool down. And so the intended purpose on the one on the left is a cuddly toy to play with. The one on the right is to add therapeutic um, support, you know, on, on joints, pains or, or, or something. So again, it's all down to the intended purpose. You know, that you cannot lie about. So some people, um, would often ask the question, you know, what if I don't say, what if I sell that as a toy? Um, and then also suggest, oh, by the way, you know, you can eat that up for joint pains. Well, if you're looking to sell it, if a marketing message is that it provides therapeutic um, help, then, you know, you're breaking the law because therapeutic um, support device is a medical device. Um, the, the definition, um, and I know this is quite long, but if you think about what you're doing, um, what you intend to do, how you intend to sell it, the marketing messages that you hope to convey, you look for terms like, oh, sorry, you look for terms like diagnosis, for monitoring, for prediction, when you can see them all there, but tends to be diagnosis and monitoring um, are very much another mindset for an awful lot of people. I want this to be able to help doctors diagnose the situation, but it's not really a medical device. Well, if it's helping a doctor diagnose a situation, it is a medical device. It monitors your pain level, you know, so a healthcare professional can actually do it, can actually take that information and, and make decisions on it. So you've got to be very, very careful. Um, even in the language that you then use, 
And there is nothing wrong with saying, I'm not a medical device. But if you're not a medical device and you intend that to be the case, then avoid in your marketing materials using any terminology that might suggest that you are. So if you've got, if, if we determine then that we have a medical device and we understand our intended purpose, um, how we're going to sell it to our, our customers. The next question is, well, what's the classification of that device? Um, and look, there just isn't time today to go into this, but there are annexes within the regulation that basically um, outline just a step-by-step -step rule, rule based approach to saying, does my device do this? You know, is it an invasive device? Is it, um, is it an intermittent device? Is it continuous use? And so on. And at the end of the, uh, that process, you will determine whether your device is a class one, um, class 2A, class 2B, and a class 3. Um, as I say, there isn't really an awful lot of time to go into that in detail today, but that is another very important step in this journey of understanding exactly where you sit with it. The, the next stage, um, and as you can see, I mean, from this route to market, you know, there's a, there's a lot in that. There's a lot of steps in that. And most people presume that it's really about the quality management system, which is a huge part. But as you can see, it is still just one of the steps that you have to take. So what do, what do we actually mean by a quality management system? Um, and what is it? Well, I mean, it, it, is a, it is a set of procedures, you know, and, uh, and processes, defining processes for how you want your company um, to operate. Um, and it's important that this isn't, I don't just mean how you build the products, but how as a company you provide training, you know, how you deal with customer complaints, how you deal with purchasing, how you deal with suppliers. So there's a lot actually in a quality management system. Um, and of course, you know, you could be within that QMS, you could be addressing a number of standards you know, we see the 134851 there, which is the obvious one, but you have to have the risk one there, the 14971. If you're developing software, you have to consider the 62304. You know, if you're dealing with medical equipment, 6601, um, and probably what a lot of people are seeing nowadays as well, although it's not mandatory, um, but a, a um, security infrastructure one is the 27001. So what you actually, what the regulator, what the, um, or, or sorry, what your regulatory person manager, your quality manager, quality assurance manager, whatever you decide to call them, what their purpose is, is to put in place that QMS and address all of the different standards that that company is going to need to comply with. But what they deliver out at the other end is a quality management system. So what your staff see is the quality management system, you know, not the standards. You're not asking people, you know, to develop expertise and all the different standards and what they all mean. Your staff are asked to understand and undergo the training um, to be able to follow the quality management system. So that's the interface. Um, in terms of the, the content for that, um, you know, the EU MDR generally breaks down into the sections that I've shown. Um, and look, I mean, one of the things that I have always recognized is that, um, that this is, can be quite overwhelming for a new start company. It can be particularly overwhelming for a spin out. Um, you know, and a, a lot of people sort of transitioning from that sort of research role to, to commercial role. Um, and what I've always done is address this as almost three phases, you know, because the first phase that you've got is you're really trying to deal with your infrastructure, if I can call it that, for the QMS. In other words, how am I going to control my documents? How am I going to control my records? How am I going to control any changes to all of that? You know, and then how am I going to build my product? So the designs, and that's when you start to put in place a technical file. So just even doing phase one, you know, allows you to get up and going. You know, what you do not need to have at the very beginning is a full quality management system. You know, what, because there are elements within this QMS that you're not going to encounter as a company for quite a while. 
So the bits that you will encounter from the off are those that I sort of list in phase one. And then as you get that, you know, get that going and get the product um, developing and you follow the, the standards and the processes that you've, that you've defined uh, for building the products and managing your documentation, et cetera. Then you can look at all some of the other internal, I, I, I like to think of it as a lot of the other internal procedures, you know, like um, your internal auditing, um, your training, you know, um, corrective and preventative actions. Um, and then you move to phase three, which is then going to be very much the external side of it, you know, where you have to write the procedures and the processes for dealing with customer complaints, for reporting adverse events and for post-market surveillance, et cetera. So just, just, I mean, it is overwhelming and I can't say it's not, but every step begins or every journey begins with a first step. And as long as you take the steps, and appreciate that this is something that's building and builds with you. And it's not that you need to have it all in place. And the important thing also to realize is when you finish writing your SOPs and your quality management system, that's the easy bit done. You know, in truth, I mean, I, I, I say that, you know, and I suppose I apologize because you haven't seen that before, but um, the harder part is actually complying with your own quality management system because you have said, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this. And what auditors will always do is they'll walk in and say, okay, you said you were going to do that. Show me. Show me how you've done that. So if you said that I'm going to sort of monitor my suppliers and I'm going to do a supplier quality file, the harder part, believe it or not, rather than writing a procedure to do it, you know, is well, okay, show me how you've done that with the supplier. And so they're the bits that, that do actually take a lot of thought. And when you come to do them, that's when you realize, you know, whether the process is or isn't working for you and do not be afraid to change it. So sorry, I'm just in more detail. These are the mandatory SOPs that I see that you need in a quality management system. And as I've mentioned there, you know, the ones that I would deal in a phase one and a phase two and a phase three. So after that, then we prefer prepare a technical file. Um, and this is all the information associated with your device, you know, the product, but it, it's also further than that and your suppliers and your any corrective actions and the quality systems and clinical data, you know, so there's a lot goes into this um, technical file. Um, and again, we sort of are fortunate enough in that we have uh, a table of contents provided by the regulator to do that. And just always remember, it was not written down, it didn't happen, which is why that technical file becomes a beast. Um, you've got to prove, and everything, every record that you generate is your evidence that you have actually delivered against your quality management system. And um, if you, as, as Irish companies, um, we can sell throughout Europe. We register with the, the HPRA, which is the Health Products Reg Regulatory Agency in Dublin. Um, and that gives us access throughout the EU 27. Um, but if you want to sell your product um, in, say, for example, the UK, then what you're going to need is an authorised representative um, in the UK. If you're going to sell in the US, you need an authorised representative there. Um, and quite often that can be an office that you establish yourself and you can put one person there, or it could be a partner, or it can be some people that actually do this for a living, um, you know, operate as authorized representatives. But essentially what it means is if I'm the FDA and you're selling a product in the US and something goes wrong, whose door do I wrap? You know, who do I come and see? And they're not going to come to Ireland, they're going to go to your authorized representative. So they have to be somebody that works very, very closely and completely understands your quality management system. Um, as I mentioned there before, then the notified body on um, well, class one sterile, class two A, two B and, and three, your QMS and your technical file, they get audited by notified body and they issue the CE mark. Otherwise, it flows down through class one and you register directly with the competent authority and where your authorized representative is based. Um, 
<clears throat> at the end of that sort of process, you prepare a declaration of conformity. And this is the legally binding document. This is the document that your CEO writes and says, I declare that I have conformed with the regulations. Um, and I suppose there's more, I always feel that there's more emphasis on those that class one devices because you're not being audited. You know, they are taking your word for it that you have put the QMS in place. But at this point, as the CEO of that class one medical device, you are saying, I declare I have a quality management system in place um, and we follow it. Um, and then um, with the class one, the certification doesn't expire if you're compliant or within scope. So again, back to that intended use thing, I would say this is what I intend to do, but as your product maybe evolves, it could evolve to being a class 2A or class 2B. So consider that, but if it's a class one, the certification does not expire um, if you're compliant. If you've had to go through the notified body stage, then on an annual or maybe every two years, your notified body will come in and they will audit you. It's called a surveillance audit. And they will look and they will issue you with non-compliances in which you've got to fix another in order to be able to keep the CE certification. So um, just sort of finishing off this stage of the, um, of the presentation, um, you know, just a couple of my thoughts in terms of achieving the compliance. Um, I mean, start early, you know, because it's what it's one of the heartaches that I see with a lot of um, a lot of projects that get up and going as commercial. I know the the pull to sort of build the product and get proving it, but documentation is hugely important. And if you're able, even at the beginning, to write concept documents, to write your product requirement specs you know, to do some level of testing, you know, build that in from the very, very beginning um, and do that so that you're able to generate the evidence. The evidence is the important bit. Um, so how do I design and build the QMS? Well, look, I, I think there's basically three ways in which you can do this. Um, you know, one, you can seek consultancy help and assistance, which tends to be probably the most popular route. Um, it'd be interesting to hear Aidan uh, after this, you know, what, what way they went with it. Um, and then, of course, you can develop it yourself. You know, if you've got some expertise or feel you want to have a go at it yourself, then the information's there in the regulations and the standards. It's just maybe difficult to interpret a lot of that. Um, or another route that you can do is you can purchase a template system. You know, and there are some good ones out there. I think... Um, uh, the Greenlight Guru, I think that's their name, um, seem to be a very, very good company in providing the template system. So, but what they're doing is it's a template system, you know, and um, while they're great to get going with, it still needs that customization. You know, I think that a quality management system has to work for the company. And what, when you find the non-compliances, you tend to find it in areas where people just don't believe their own processes. You know, we were told to do it this way, but it's not really the way I want to do it. And that's particularly evident in building products. You know, I use this life cycle model. They are telling me to do it that way. And you start then with all the non-compliance, you don't get it. So, you know, really always think about, um, you know, that you have to own it. And if it's not working for you, you change it. And so we, I would suggest, even if you're dealing with the template system, but sometimes you still might need a little bit of help in that. Um, and consider commercial decisions in conjunction with regulatory ones. You cannot think of these things as separate um, because, I mean, commercial decisions, even just from the logistics of the suppliers, you need the sort of regulatory approval for a lot of your critical suppliers. But you also need to think, and I'm, I'm sure this is the situation with a number of you, I have a product and I'm pretty sure it's not a medical device. Well, look, that's great. You know, um, if you can get market share with that. But what happens if I have to differentiate myself in some way, or I want to evolve my product in some way, and all of a sudden I want to start doing things that are medical device like? Um, well, then that's a commercial decision as well. Or even I'm a class one product or, or class 2A, is there some way of scaling back on the features that I'm presenting here? so I can keep it as a class one. 
and get to market without needing that notified body because that again that is an extra overhead it's an extra cost and it's there's, there is a long lead time with them as well so these are a lot of commercial decisions in conjunction with the, the regulatory requirements as well so just consider that um so as Sarah mentioned, look, I hope I have time to sort of go through this for, for some of the software people, and I appreciate that maybe this is not appropriate for, for everybody. Um, but look, I am just doing it, going to do it very quickly. And if you need any further information, you know, please feel free to get back in touch with us. So, Peter, before you move on to that section, can I yeah. ask uh, Ross O'Driscoll to come on the mic for a second? Ross has a question for you, and I'm just not sure I understand the question entirely. So um, is that OK if we bring in a few questions at this stage? Yep, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So, Ross, do you want to ask your question there, please? Yeah. Thanks very much. Hi, Peter. Um, yeah, I, I've just um, recently joined the company I'm with, um, X Wave, and they've just completed uh, ISO twenty seven thousand and one um, certification. And I'm wondering, like, from going through that process, like, what I've seen is that there's a lot of documentation that they had to produce. They had to you know, document their processes, their policies, all of that. I'm wondering how much of that can be borrowed um, for, for going in through the MDR process? Um, well, look, listen, quite, quite a lot. Um, I mean, the, 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 one, the one caution that I always give is 27,001 is probably a standard that your customer has asked for. You know, I mean, it's not, you know what I mean? It's not a, yeah. from a legal perspective, it's not mandatory where 13485 is, you know, and, and I think that's why people always need to have that additional support, if you like. Um, but look, absolutely, when you come to take in all these different standards, you should not see a procedure for doing something in 27001 uh, and doing the same thing again in a separate procedure for 13485. You shouldn't do that. As I was mentioned on a previous slide, you know, your quality management system, um, you know, should be for your staff, it should be oblivious to the standards that it's trying to address. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Thanks, Peter. And Peter, I have another question for you. Um, so we have a, 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 a participant who would like to, first of all, the participant says, thank you, this is incredibly inform informative. And then they would like to know, would the, will the NHS be more likely to procure a medical device if it is a class two monitored device rather than a class one un unmonitored device? And if so, can you choose to apply for a class two over a class one? Okay, um, it makes no difference. I think what it is, I mean, in terms of being able to sell it, I think, you know, what you're going to have to do is convince somebody that your product, I mean, this is the commercial side of it, you're trying to convince somebody that you know your product has um, has value, you know, in that healthcare um, environment, and I don't think that matters whether it's class one or class two. Um, the what, what was the other part of the question? Sorry, the um, so the question then would be: If so, uh, should you choose to apply for class two over class one? Oh yeah, sorry. So um, the thing is, um, when you follow the rules and you come out as a class one product, you can't make it a class two. You know, there, there are things that are just very definite. If you are not a medical device, you cannot go to the HPRA and say, I won't classify me anyway as one. I just would like to have the badge. They, they will tell you where to go, you know, because they're only there to deal with medical devices. Um, so, you know, you, you can't ask for it. Likewise, as I mentioned at the very beginning, if what your intended purpose is, is to perform functionality of a medical device, you must then get the CE mark. Okay, thanks, Peter. And uh, we have a question from Marguerite. So Marguerite, I'm just going to ask you to come on the mic and ask your question, if you don't mind. Sorry, Marguerite, I just unmuted unmute, uh, you by accident. Uh, yep. There you go. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks very much. It is very informative. Um, I'm working for a company again, fairly recent edition. Um, I've been in the biotech API space for a long time, so I'm moving into digital health space. Um, we have a software product which consists of a portal that links up to hospitals and a patient apps. 
the key thing here is uh, the decision has kind of been made internally in the organization and just I'm kind of going as I look at this should we be class one maybe but what they have made to date is that we're not a medical device so therefore software as a medical device it uh, doesn't comply because we don't it doesn't the app doesn't perform the diagnosis or tell the, the physician but it aids them in decision making and the treatment of patients uh, we're, we're using clinical trials and stuff like that so it aids the physician is what we say it doesn't predict it uh, doesn't do the diagnosis so uh, yeah and maybe i should have made that a little bit clearer so um it doesn't have to be like an intelligent system that does a diagnosis for you what i mean there is is it involved in the diagnosis process somewhere so in other words are you calculating information are you collecting calculating data or results or scores that a healthcare professional is going to use to make a decision. Yes. Well, then it would be the medical device. I mean, what one of my companies, what we done was, um, you, have you heard of news, the National Early Warning Score? No, I haven't. Well, I mean, if you're ever, if you're ever in hospital and you look at the patient chart at the end of the bed, you will see a little section in that called news. And basically what a nurse is meant to do is when she takes all your observations, so your blood pressure, your temperature, your heart rate, and so on, um, they calculate um, a score. And there's a little algorithm that they that they have in their heads um, that they use to calculate that score. And they get like from anything from one to 15, but depending on that number, they do something with it. Um, and I, you know, that became a medical device because it wasn't that you were just collecting the data. We were actually going to compute a score. We were going to do something with the data that a healthcare professional would use. If you're just collecting the data and presenting it straight back out again, you're not a medical device. Well, I think you flipped it on its head. We, we are analyzing. We have this thing called PROMS for the patient's score and we collate and use that scoring then. To, to help with the, the, the treatment plans. Yeah, I mean, so, okay, so, um, yeah, I think I've heard of something similar, a product, something similar. And look, I'm happy to follow up with you. I mean, obviously these things can't be definitive, you know, in a, in a brief chat. Um, you really want to look out and, uh, and consider everything. So, again, back to your intended purpose. If your intended purpose is going to be, you know, we collect this data from a patient and we compute a score, um, or we do something even with the data, and we present that to a healthcare professional who is going to use that either in the diagnosis or how they're going to develop their treatment plan, then it is a medical device. And are you swaying more towards class one? Well, it would be class one because it's probably an algorithm that's def defined, you know, so... Okay. What basically what you say is I'm taking a gold standard, well, I'm taking an algorithm that could be written down um, and I'm just computing, you know, I'm not, I'm not doing the monitoring, not doing the diagnosis. I'm actually just computing a score from that and computing a value. And that algorithm doesn't change. That would be the other thing to be conscious of because there's an awful lot of AI being built into products. Mm -hmm. So what you have to be able to say is that algorithm is consistent and repeatable, you know, and doesn't do any learning um, in its operation. Okay, okay, thank you for that. Um, I might take your time again. I'm conscious I don't want to use up all the time, but yeah, it's been in, in light, enlightening. Okay. Thanks, Thanks Marguerite. To the question, Marguerite. Thanks a lot. Okay, Peter, so I'll ask you to move on now to your next section, which is um, uh, software as a medical device. Thank you. Okay, well, look, I'm going to go through this very quickly, but I do recognize it was a number of people involved in digital health. So this is going to be um, relevant for them. Um, and what we have to consider the different forms of software. So I, I'm old enough to remember back when the, the regulators actually said for the first time that a software application, even if it's just an application standalone, if it performs all the functions that we had in that definition of a medical device, then it is a medical device. Um, of course, software can be that sort of embedded module within a, a product or can be a component of one. So there is a very specific um, functionality with the software or it can be an accessory. And an accessory means that 
Uh, typically, this is the sort of the, 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 the apps or accessories because maybe the main product that's a, a sensor technology will be doing one piece of it. And then they can send that data to a, a, an app, which maybe trends it or something like that. But they could also send it somewhere else. And that's the important bit. Um, if it can be sent somewhere else as well as yours, then it's an accessory. If it was only yours, then it's all just integral. Um, I'm not going to go through this, but I can certainly leave it with you um, to sort of look at this and ask yourself these questions. So this is a decision diagram, um, thanks to the MHRA, I think. Um, you know, is, is your um, software um, a medical device or not? And so if you can actually follow that down through it, you can see, um, you know, what, what falls out. But, you know, because software can just be um, instructions or it can be data, you know, it can be statistical um, evaluations or it can actually be that it's performing and, and Marguerite, I think, you know, the, the question you sort of asked there was, is my software performing an action on the data? Well, yes, is it for the benefit of an individual patient? Yes, you know, um, is, is the action for the purpose to find the art? Well, I mean, you're, you're coming out into the medical device regulations. So the only choice is it's, it could be an accessory, you know, which again, it's a medical device. Okay. Um, as if classification um, in itself wasn't hard enough, we've also got to um, classify the software um, in terms of a safety class. Uh, it's, a, it's a simple algorithm, um, which you basically follow through and that's it on the, you know, on the screen. Um, class A means that there's no injury. Um, class B means there's minor injury. And sometimes these things are um, difficult to actually interpret. What do you mean by uh, no injury, you know, or minor injury? And you think it's software. Well, you have to really look at it in, in the sort of the detail to say, well, what if my software malfunctioned? What if I give the wrong value for heart rate? You know, and now all of a sudden, um, a healthcare professional is going to, is going to administer drugs to try and reduce my heart rate. And at the whole time, it wasn't my heart rate that was up. It was the algorithm that was wrong. So this is where you have to think about, well, what if my software went wrong? What would it mean? Um, and, uh, and you've got to classify that. 62304 is the standard that we look to, to address, and it's one of the harmonized standards in the world. So in other words, every regulator, um, FDA, European, UK, you know, Australia, China, that they all follow the harmonized standard of 62304. Um, for those involved in software, they'll appreciate all the different stages um, uh, this is just the sort of scheme that I, I, I've drawn up myself. And for those um, software guys there that probably think agile and all the rest of it, um, you know, there are, there's a number of just considerations to make in terms of the life cycle model that you would want. But if you're going to build a product, you're going to define it. You're going to put your system requirements together. If that is only software, then, you know, you can, um, that, that's one and the same. And then you're going to think about the architecture of your product. You're going to build out the design. Then you're going to implement it. And the reason it's sort of the V model is because you say, well, you see, when I'm writing this software requirements, I'm also going to write this, which is um, how am I going to test it? You can't do the test yet because it's not built, but you'll at least be able to know the test that you've got to run. And the same with the architecture. It's more the integration of components coming together. So that's, if you like, a life cycle model. That's a, a, a very basic one. You can get hybrid ones. You can, there's other ones if you are into it yourself and want to deal with Agile or Lean or, or some of the others. Um, and then the whole way through that, you've got to deal with the sort of project management, risk management, traceability, and so on. So look, sorry that was so quick, but I do think the software bit um, does actually add on another level, you know, that of consideration over the other medical devices. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Peter. Um, that's extremely informative. And um, I know that um, I can see people hitting their keyboards already to ask me, can we get those slides afterwards? So yes, Peter very <laughs> kindly offered to send those on. Um, so next I'm going to hand over to Aidan Boren. And as Peter said, Aidan is going to talk us through his own journey through MDR, how he classified his medical device and determined uh, whether and how it needed to be classified. So Aidan, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Sarah. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, so I, I'll 
um, go through um, three or four slides. I've only got three or four slides. So, um, so I'm I'm Aidan Boren. I'm founder and CEO of um, a digital health startup called Digital Gate Labs, um, and our product basically is used by clinicians in the public health system to um, essentially carry out uh, frailty analysis in the over 65 population. Um, my own background, just to give you an idea, I'm uh, my background is in, in industry in the telecommunications R&D, um, but I've had a passion for applying um, AI and a, uh, AR kind of in the healthcare space. So um, that kind of brought me on the journey. Um, and the, the journey was, um, uh, I, I really focus on, on the um, kind of product uh, development activities that we did and how they intersect with um, with MDR and clinical investigations and the, the regulatory um, path. So, but broadly speaking, we, we started in 2019, um, uh, raised some funding through the Enterprise Ireland commercialization funds. Um, so that allowed us to essentially spin in uh, the idea into DCU. Um, and that provided funding for both building our, our MVP, minimum viable product, uh, carry out the clinical evaluations and investigations with, with real patients and so on, and then step through the kind of regulatory process um, uh, up to where we are today. So today we, we've spun back out um, and we have a, a class one CE marked medical device um, uh, and it, it kind of forms the basis of what I'll kind of talk about. So just to put a little bit of context around the um, the tool itself, um, just to put it on the spectrum of, of um, medical device technology. So our, we, we have a, an app which is used by clinicians and there is a cloud um, system as well that does processing. So essentially our clinical uh, users uh, use the app to record a video of a particular um, a, a geriatric assessment. It's sent to the cloud for processing and they get some results back within a kind of short space of time. So, um, and where that kind of adds value is really um, in terms of identifying um, a clinical condition called frailty in the over 65 population, good good value for a good reason for doing that. So, um, so just to put us into the, the spectrum of um, uh, of where we are. Um, so again, we're we're a class one device. We're measurement. Um, uh, used by clinicians, but not for diagnosis, and we're we're all software, so we're we're on the very edge of um, you know being a a uh, medical device. And I'll have to say that um, probably not a day goes by that I don't question our decision um, to go down the route of being a, a med dev, um, uh, and exactly for that reason that. Um, we're on the border between um, being a um, uh, diagnostic tool versus a, a measurement device. And I'll talk through some of the, um, uh, the journey that we took to try and understand which side is the, the boundary to, to, to fall on, but it's, it's not, frankly, for us, it wasn't a binary decision and, um, uh, it took us quite some time as well in in to 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 come to terms with it because originally um, we were of the view that we probably weren't a medical device um, and it was really only in dealing with um, both the clinical teams um, as well as some uh, consultants that were advising us that we that we moved down this particular route. So um, so. I'll talk about three things, um, and uh, so first, really, is is the. Aidan, um, before you move on, can I just tell you that you're not in present mode? Okay, no problem. 
Let me. Hopefully that's, can everyone see that? Yeah, we can. You're not in yeah, present sure. mode. Maybe if you click view over at the left uh, of your screen, it might switch from speaker mode to present mode. And if not, it's fine. We'll just carry on. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, this view. View, enter full screen. How about that? Uh, no, it still hasn't come up as present mode for me, but I'm going to mute myself and let you carry on because we're getting oh, the, okay. the gist of what you okay, say no, very well. No, Thank you. No, 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 no problem. So yeah, it, it's really three areas. Um, one is, and um, I think Peter referred to it earlier, um, is, and it's a pivot point, and the pivotal point is actually understanding and kind of writing down what your intended use is. Um, and that goes a long way towards helping you decide um, which side of the, you know, um, uh, whether you're a medical device or not, and then which of the kind of categories you might fit into. Now, let me preface everything that I'm, I'm not a medical device expert and I, um, you know, simplify things for the process of, of understanding myself. But as I understand the, the, the process, you know, this measurement, this diagnostic capability and then this therapeutic and you know that's going from not being a medical device through class one class two and class three and so on and the both the cost and time is you know grows um probably exponentially as you move from from the left to the right across those categories so um so intended use really helped us understand um you know where to place ourselves and one of the key uh, things that we did um, was um, actually to look at our competitors um, and uh, the both the FDA site and um, some of the um, UK regulatory sites, um, the, the nice.co.uk um, provide a overview of you know, health technology assessments across different um, products and areas and so on. So that really actually helped us decide, well, all our competitors were measurement devices, class one, some of them were class two. So it really gave us an idea of um, maybe the journey we had to take. And um, so, and, and there is, um, I would say, um, you know, certainly if you're selling into the public health system, um, there's a certain gravitas that comes from having a, having gone through the process. So um, the FDA site um, is, is quite an old web technology, but once you persist with it, there's some excellent reviews of, uh, you know, probably every other medical device that they've ever, ever gone through. A second resource for intended use. Um, so the HPRA are excellent at, uh, and at least when we did it, they had a service, free service whereby you gave them an overview of what your your product and technology was, and they would come back to you within um, four weeks with a, an assessment, a fairly shallow assessment of you know um, what they thought it was and where it fitted in. Um, so we certainly used that. Um, the third route for intended use then is is um, you know the. the your, your clinical users, our users were clinical people working in the acute system and working in nursing homes. So um, just by, you know, talking and interviewing them and learning what they felt um, kind of helped us there as well. And I suppose finally, the, the, the quite a few med tech incubators that um, are, are definitely worth going um, to uh, in order to meet other companies who are maybe have gone through the same um, pain. We did engage a consultant um, uh, med tech expert um, uh, at, the, at the very, very early stage. Um, and they, they did two things for us. One is they drew out a roadmap of um, what, what it was um, kind of we had to do. Um, uh, and then, um, you know, we picked off some of the bits that, um, that were, um, you know, uh, farmed out to 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 other companies and so on. So, um, so I, I I would be strongly of the opinion that um, if you're going through even for a class one, it's 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 in the long run it's worth um, the effort. Um, it's 
cheaper in the long run and it's faster in the long run to to have someone who's maybe gone through it before um uh you know uh working with you so um so once the intended use um is is kind of clear it really puts you in the position where um you know one of the key assets that um you need to to figure out is uh, and again I think Peter kind of spoke about it was uh, is going about the evaluation um, and it's it's a, a, a non trivial exercise um, and for the purposes of um, uh, you know just um, uh, kind of clarity here I suppose there were two key documents. Um, in terms of the, um, the the kind of regulatory pathway for us in terms of doing the uh, clinical evaluation. So one is, is an investigation plan, a CIP. Um, so in conjunction with the HPRA, um, if you are using live patients, horrible terminology, sorry, but real patients in a the hospital, then you the process really is... Um, you know, applying for um, or filling out a, a DPIA data protection impact assessment as one document. There's an ethics application then typically with the hospital um, um, or a clinical institution that you're working with. And then um, we applied to the HPRA for a license to operate the clinical evaluation. And that takes about um, a minimum of three months um, and probably a maximum of six months. They've a kind of a time um, guillotine at the end of it. And the output of that is that they give you approval to actually conduct your evaluation or not. And the way they make that evaluation is based on the clinical investigation plan. Um, and this is a non-trivial document. I've just shown the table of contents of our one here that goes into about 50 pages and it covers lots of uh, the nuance that um, that Peter spoke about earlier in terms of your, um, you know, uh, adverse event handling, um, what testing you've done already before you kind of introduce it to to live people and so on. So in in spite of all of that kind of process and documentation, um, it does have significant value beyond um, you know the, the the document itself because it it really puts you into a, a a frame of mind where you're working very very closely with with your users your clinical team so there is a, a beneficial um, uh, add-on there as well that's um, uh, perhaps not um, um, you know often um, spoken about in in the um, clinical area so really two areas you know so the output of your clinical evaluation then you know what is that well it's usually um from the clinical people it's a studies um published studies so we did two evaluations a, a technical one to prove our technology and then a, a second clinical one with real patients in particular populations and your clinical evaluation plan guides you through the process that you need in terms of what kind of statistical treatment you need to give to the data, you know, how you collect the data, where you store it, and all of that um, stuff that's needed. So um, the again, this is not something that can be done in, in a few days, frankly. Our evaluation was about nine months um, uh, in, in terms of runtime. Um, and you know, time and cost as well. I'll talk a little bit about the cost at the very end. Um, so the evaluation then brings you to um, my third and, and final point, which is really about the, the QMS itself. So all of this, um, uh, you know, again, Peter, simplifying... Can I just ask you to click on your last slide there so we can see it? If you can click on the slide, I presume now you're talking about slide eight. If you can maybe click on it. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Is that the one you're on now? That's the one I'm on. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, so broadly speaking, um, again, as as Peter mentioned, um, for even for a class one device, there are a collection of uh, procedures that you need to have implemented. Um, uh, you know, they're kind of realized. You know, in a technical file. Um, that could be a you know pen and paper based system. You'd be crazy to use a pen and paper based system, but it, it, I guess it could be. 
for our um, electronic QMS, we used um, our product is software. We're using GitHub and GitLab, which is a really um, excellent tool for change control, document control, um, issue management, and so on. So we used that as the formulation for uh, all of the um, uh, assets that are, are in the technical file. So that's how we structured our um, kind of QMS and everything we've done since we've been regulated goes in there, um, you know, design reviews, code reviews, bug fixes. Um, so every single um, time someone touches the medical device, which is software in our case, um, you know, there's a, there's a record there for, for posterity. So, um, so th that was, that was our journey basically. So, um, uh, and, you know, I think the, um, pivot point, uh, just to summarize for us really was um, understanding what your intended use is, then figuring out what the clinical evaluation is, and then building the, the QMS basic, basically on top of that. So um, that's more or less everything I, I had to, uh, um, had to say today. So um, happy to take questions on anything or to take questions offline if people want to talk offline. So. That's great, Peter. And uh, sorry, Aidan. And Peter, I'll ask you to be back on your camera now as well, please. Um, so, Aidan, I'm just going to um, summarise what you what you said. Uh, my understanding of it um, to make sure that that um, that I've got it clear in my head. So, first of all, you had to determine the use of your medical device and determine its uh, classification. And um, you said that this was a non-binary decision that was predominantly market-led, that your clinical uh, sites needed you to have uh, it, it, the stamp of approval, let's say, um, of, of the medical device uh, classification. Would that be correct to say? Uh, yeah, so that's that's absolutely right. We 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 spoke to our 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 customers, but we also looked at our competitors as well. So it it kind of gives you a a landscape of maybe where you should be um, uh, with respect to those. Um, and it, it, um, and then I'm just going to ask you. So you 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 um evaluated your uh your medical device in two sites i know you, you, you've told me that off air um yeah. and uh so just for the benefit of our audience um who uh, some of our audience are looking to get into sites to to conduct clinical evaluations what channels did you go through there did you use hse digital transformation or health innovation hub ireland or what were your channels um so so our two so absolutely right we did two one one of the advantages, um, so we spun into DCU. So the first part, our, our kind of technical evaluation was done inside DCU and they have the labs and infrastructure to do that. Um, uh, in terms of the clinical evaluation, um, we have as a company, we have excellent um, networks into the healthcare service. Our product is clinician led, so it was led and co-developed with um, Tallow University Hospital primarily. Um, so we had um, very solid linkage into the hospital in terms of the, the kind of clinical need um, there. So um, just to, to sharpen the pencil on, on that point particularly, so we didn't use either, you know, we, we didn't go into the HSC top down. We essentially went bottom up from, from our connectivity into, um, into the HSC. Um, uh, you know, having said all of that, you know, there are probably follow up evaluations for new features that we'll um, probably discuss um, with with the Health Innovation Hub as well um, in terms of living labs and so on. But, you know, um, we, we didn't use that um, because we had good connectivity with, with the hospital already. OK, and then your next stage was to uh, engage with HIPRA. Um, and to get the approval of HIPRA to, so you're, what you're seeking there is approval to conduct the, the, the clinical evaluation. Is that correct? So that it's not yet the clinical evaluation. So what documentation did you need to put in place to get the HIPRA uh, approval? So, so the HIP, so the clinical investigation plan and the the IB, the investigators brochure, the two kind of key documents. Um, there are a bunch of other kind of ancillaries that you need as well. Um, but that's to get the um, 
uh, approval from the HBRA to conduct the, the trial. And often the ethics committees in, in hospitals will ask for that as well. So, um, uh, so you, it, it's, um, and what it does essentially, you know, I come from a software development uh, background and, uh, you know, I found the clinical evaluation plan really focuses your mind um, uh, on the differences between that and the, the, the um, software development um, area. And one, one key learning that we had, and, you know, I think Peter kind of touched on it a little bit, was, um, you know, the idea that of an MVP, a minimum viable product, there's no clinician wants a minimum viable anything they want, you know. <laughs> um, so you need to be very clear on what it is you're delivering, how you're going to evaluate what it is, and then that's the thing that you're going to go towards regulatory with, you know. So if you come along and add 50 features after your your clinical evaluation, then you're probably going to get yourself into trouble. So um, you know, down the road. So okay. And would those documents then feed into your QMS? Yeah, so so absolutely. So they're kind of the primary um uh, kind of input and output in terms of our um evaluation and it, it goes beyond that so we we published some of the outputs in in various uh clinical um uh um uh, conferences and so on um so they're in the qms as well um uh the all of the design control so as as i mentioned um uh in terms of features, new features, new evaluations that are needed and so on all go into the QMS. Um, and we, as I mentioned, we picked, um, you know, our own, um, you know, we're already using uh, strong um, design control tools from, from our software development processes. So we essentially extended that for, for the, the QMS as well. Um, now, there are lots of QMS bespoke QMS systems out there as well, um, but we just we we picked one that we were using. Okay, and um, I'm going to ask both of you um, to maybe address the cost of this because uh, I I'm sure that our attendees are wondering how much is this going to cost, um, how, you know what are the upfront costs and is there any help out there from Enterprise Ireland or or the likes to to uh, help me, you know, to, to get across the, the, the cost uh, of this. So, um, uh, Peter, uh, Peter, I might go to you first. Um, do you have any, uh, and, and I appreciate that this could be commercially sensitive um, uh, information because you are a, a consultant yourself, but so please feel free to tell us what you, what you will. Well, I mean, rather, rather than even sort of getting into the that side of it, I mean, I, I did do some work with uh, Enterprise Ireland um, just on scoping, I mean, on a sort of a previous life. Um, and I know this is going to be scary to a lot of people, you know, but they probably um, calculated that up roughly up about 50,000 euro a year you know, for the for the first year, really, to to put that in place. If you're talking about a class two a device and above, I think you're really talking about you know, 15,000 euro plus from the notified body. Um, so look at it, it is, it is significant, but I mean, it's, it, it's because of the, obviously the legal implications that are, are on you as the manufacturer, you know, I mean, that's, that, that, that's sort of the numbers that I think you really need to be thinking about. Um, interesting, I did come through, I done um, exactly the same as Aidan done, I spun a, a, a concept into the into DKT of all places, <laughs> and uh, and used the Com Fund um, to to build the the product and then spin it out again. Um, and one of the things that that I remember we done at the time um, was we put a lot of emphasis on you know building QMS activities into that Com Fund. Um, and in fact, because it was Class One and we had everything ready, um, we spun out in the January um, and um, at the end of February. We had our CE mark, and that was even so. That was very, very quick. But look, we just had everything, um, but we 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 had expertise in the area. Um, but I think the thing is, you know, this is this can be done without significant delay if it's done right. And I think that that's an important message to get across. I think you can get funding through the comp funds because I know even now 
they're adding that additional funding in specifically, if you ask. I don't know if there's anything for an existing company um, in, in Ireland from EI um, on the regulatory space, but um, I think you might find calls out, you know, in certain, at certain times for some funding. Okay, and I would encourage attendees to come to uh, come to us and deconnect if you're at the stage where you need to uh, start this journey and you're wondering if there is funding available. It, uh, um, it very often depends on your own circumstances. So please come to us and we'll have a discussion with you and with Enterprise Ireland to see if they're able to help you. Um, so Aidan, I'll come across to you then. Um, how, how did you manage to navigate the, the financial journey, uh, the cost journey of, of MDR? Um, yeah, um, but if I start crying in the middle of this, you will you'll get a sense of it. But um, no, a very, similar, <laughs> a very similar um, process that Peter described. So we we um, in, in actuality had two com funds with one for development and we had one for the clinical evaluation, um, which was was the, the, the regulatory step. Um, I. I the figure that we we spent, I'll, I'll tell you exactly how much we spent. Um, uh, and there were two parts to it. There's the, you know, the process and procedures and engaging with the consultants and so on. And, um, you know, going through all of that. Um, and But then there's the second part, which is actually running the clinical evaluation itself. So um, you will, you know, more than likely, you will find that the hospitals are um, uh, where where we were doing our evaluation are, are very uh, commercially oriented as well. So if you're borrowing clinicians for a month or two months, they'll want you to backfill. Um, so all of that activity was actually covered for us by the the, the Com Fund. So broadly, we, we spent about sixty thousand euro over the course of the eighteen months, and it's probably split half and half between the, you know the actual process and setup and systems and the, the the other half was the actual evaluation itself um in terms of the staff and equipment and getting people up and down to uh to to the hospital and so on so um so again um it sounds uh, you know um you know from our point of view um it it was a uh supported probably as, as a startup company without the com fund i'm not sure how we would have done that frankly so um okay thanks uh, thanks very much for your for your clarity and uh and, and honesty there because it's uh you know it's a, it's a large stumbling block for for most innovators um aiden we've two questions for you how long did it take to achieve ce certification and do you intend to go commercial in the us um so how long did it take so it, um, so in, in reality, um, it was our process was probably about nine months in, in total from from start to end um, in in calendar time. We had COVID in the middle of this. So we started our evaluation. COVID arrived. We had to stop for about six months then went back in for another three months and then had another break. So in reality, it's probably over a year and a half. I think it, it probably took in, in elapsed time. But if COVID hadn't been there, I think a, a, a nine month window would have been um, enough. Uh, you know, I'm, and I'm including in that the, the actual evaluation as well. And that's probably the big time consumer because um, you become, um, you know, uh, reliant on, um, you know, for example, getting ethics approval, they run ethics approval maybe every three months so you have to sit and wait for your slot on the on the the ethics council to get that and so on so there there are some you know things that you can't change it's part of the the tax of being uh, working in in healthcare i guess so um uh i think did i answer both yeah, those absolutely. questions oh the us <laughs> uh, do, you, do you intend to go commercial US, in the US? sorry yeah. um so so we do so uh, um so in, in our roadmap for um uh for next year, the end of next year is to start all of this stuff again with the uh, through the lens of of FDA. Um, and um, right now we're in the process of of um, kind of rolling out in 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 the Irish um, system 
um, but it won't be um, the, the FDA process is um, uh, will, will will benefit from what we've done already, frankly, um, although it is a different process. Um, okay, great. And I think that that's all the questions we have in our Q&A. Aidan, Peter, would you like to um, add anything before we finish today? I'd, I'd say, I, I mean, I, I'm again, I'm not the expert, but um, uh, it seems it probably seems horribly daunting. And um, but um, it like all things, one step at a time and um, one step forward. And it is possible to get through it. We're we're living evidence of that. And I am not a med tech expert. If, if I can get through it, anyone can. So. Um. <laughs> uh, and I was just about to say exactly the same thing, <laughs> you know, like, I mean, I think all of this is quite daunting for anybody to look at, especially for the first time, but if you just take uh, the necessary steps, and I think, you know, the, the other thing that I would say, and, and you know, you, you've done this now, um, is that actually putting the QMS in place, i.e. the set of procedures, is when you look back on it, the small bit, you know, I know it takes time, but it's the generating the evidence against all of that is doing the clinical studies and it's building the product and it's, you know, dealing with customers and, uh, you know, pointing your suppliers. That's all the bit that gets generated. And that's the bit that builds your technical file. Okay. All right. Thanks very much, Peter. And I would also like to thank our attendees very much for staying on our webinar today. I know we've gone over we've gone past one o'clock and we're eating into your lunchtime um, but I just think this information was so interesting and hugely informative to anybody who's uh, working on uh, in digital health and medical devices and uh, in software as a medical device um, so thank you very much for your clarity and honesty Aidan and Peter um, and the uh, recording will be available afterwards and I will also tag Aidan and Peter in our LinkedIn post um, to so that you can then contact them directly via LinkedIn and uh, they, they can get back to you about any further queries you might have. So thanks very much, everybody, today and enjoy your lunch. Thank you very much. Bye.